Good evening or good morning, uh, wherever you are, for joining uh, this webinar. My name is Yiping Han. I'm professor of microbial sciences at Columbia University. I'm also president of Columbia University Asian Faculty Association. I'm delighted to host this webinar uh, for Dr. Mei Nai, who is the 2024 Lifetime Achievement Award recipient of Columbia University Asian Faculty Association. Um, Dr. Nai is Long Family Professor of Asian American Studies and Professor of History and Co-Director of the Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Race at Columbia University from 2018 to 2023. She received a PhD from Columbia in 1998 and taught at the University of Chicago before returning to Columbia in 2007. Dr. Nye is a US legal and a political historian interested in questions of immigration, citizenship, and nationalism. Dr. Nye is the author of several award-winning books. Um, in 2004, she published Impossible Subjects, Illegal Aliens and the Making of Modern America. And in 2010, she published The Lucky Ones, One Family and Extraordinary Invention of the Chinese America. This book is available in Chinese and published in both mainland and Taiwan. In 2021, she published the Chinese question, the gold rushes, and the global politics, which is the topic of tonight. And this book won the 2012 Bancroft Prize and was a finalist for the LA Times Book Prize in History and a spot and shortlisted for the Condil Prize. Dr. Nye is also editor of Corky Lee's Asian America, 50 Years of Photography Justice which is just published last week. Dr. Nai is an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She has been a Guggenheim Fellow, a Radcliffe Fellow, and a Kluge Chair at the Library of Congress, and also has received fellowships from the Institute for Advanced Study, the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library, and the Russell Sage Foundation, among others. She has written on immigration history and a policy for the Washington Post, New York Times, LA Times, The Atlantic, and The Nation. Before becoming a historian, Dr. Nye was a labor union organizer and educator in New York City. She's now writing a new book, Nation of Immigrants, A Short History of an Idea. We're very lucky to have Dr. Nye. Dr. Nye, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Han. Uh, thank you to the Columbia Global Center of Beijing for hosting tonight. And thank you to the Columbia University Asian Faculty Association. It was a huge honor to be uh, awarded uh, their prize th earlier this spring. And, um, and I'm delighted to uh, deliver this lecture to you today. So thank you all for joining. I'm going to um, share my screen now, uh, technology willing. Okay, we have the screen. Fine, okay, thank you. So uh, my book, The Chinese Question, is about the origins of Chinese diasporic communities in the West uh, and the rise of the racist movements and exclusion laws passed against them. I examined the regime of exclusion that was enacted throughout the Anglophone world, that is in the United States and the British settler colonies, uh, and the struggles of the Chinese immigrants for respect and equal treatment as well as China itself in the international community. As Dr. Han has alluded, my own background is in US history and Asian American history. 
This book began with an interest in the origins of the US Chinese exclusion laws, but it grew to become a comparative and global history. The research and writing of this book posed many challenges, which were at once historiographic, linguistic, and archival. I had to learn about the histories of the British Empire, about Qing China, as well as the history of money. Certainly, I remain a novice when it comes to these fields. But through my research and thinking across fields and in a global context, I developed new insights into the Chinese question. I came to understand that Chinese exclusion policies across the Anglo-American world were not only matters of domestic racism in the formation of nation states. That is generally how uh, the field understands this question. But I believe they were also integral to the development of late 19th century global capitalism, the ascent of Great Britain and the United States as global economic hegemons, as creditors and as colonizers, as nation builders and as empire builders. Now, because China was never formally colonized, the Western powers imposed measures like the exclusion laws, as well as the unequal treaties, which we know a lot about, um, as instruments of colonialism and containment. Exclusion aimed to contain China, to limit the mobility of its people to the West. So the book then is about the dynamics of race and money, in other words, colonialism and capitalism in the late 19th and early 20th century. Chinese exclusion was part of a new way of imagining, organizing, and governing the world. The Chinese question was simply this. Were Chinese a racial threat to so-called white men's countries? And should they be excluded from immigration and citizenship? Exclusion was a radical idea in the late 19th century because it contravened prevailing norms of free trade and free migration. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble moving my screen. I locate the origins of the Chinese question of the gold rushes in the second half of the 19th century, focusing on California, the Australian colony of Victoria, and then in the early 20th century, in gold mining uh, in the British colony of the Transvaal. The gold rushes launched into motion hundreds of thousands of people from the British Isles, continental Europe, the Americas, Australasia, and China. Notably, these were the first occasions of large scale contact between Westerners, that is Europeans and Americans and Chinese people. There are three major themes uh, in the book. First, I wish to slay the coolie myth. The coolie myth is the idea that Chinese are a coolie race, that is, they are indentured laborers, innately servile and docile, and ruled by despotic masters. This myth was central to the rationale that Chinese should be excluded from the countries of the West because they were a threat to free labor and democratic government. The myth has its origins in the anti-Chinese movements of the late 19th century. And it is a major task of my book to disprove this myth and to analyze the reasons for its emergence, popularity, and circulation. But to slay the Cooley myth required that I first approach it as an empirical question. That is, if Chinese were not contracted or indentured laborers, what were they? What did they do? Second, I address the Cooley myth as a discursive question. That is, how did anti-Chinese politics arise on the gold fields in different national and colonial contexts? And how did they evolve into a global racial discourse? And third, what was the relationship between the exclusion laws in the West, the rise of the international gold standard in monetary affairs and China's position in the global economy? So let me start with the California gold rush. The general pattern that I discovered was that Chinese were both part of mainstream gold field economies, while they also developed their own styles of work and social organization. All gold seekers on the California and Victorian gold fields worked as partners in small cooperative groups and on wages for large companies. 
These men here at a sluicing operation in Auburn Ravine in California likely worked for wages. Like white Americans, Chinese work with people who were relatives or from their hometowns, although village and lineage ties were stronger in the Chinese case than among white Americans. The Chinese favored two kinds of organization in particular. One was a small company headed by an investor manager, typically a local merchant, perhaps someone who is a former gold digger, who would hire upwards of 20 men or lease their claims to them. Another type was a small cooperative. These were typically six to 12 men who shared all expenses and profits and had no boss. In Australia, cooperative groups joined together to work down a creek or a gully in a method called paddocking. In both North America and Australia, cooperatives were associated with secret brotherhood societies, fictive kin collectivities that were all associated, all associated with the Zhigongdang, which started as an exile group from the Taiping Rebellion in China and spread throughout Southeast Asia, North America, and Australia. Both companies and cooperatives were similar to mining organizations found in China and Southeast Asia. In Southern China, placer techniques or surface mining uh, were used to mine tin and iron sand deposits and also drew from agricultural water irrigation practices. Small companies of full-time miners often comprise landless and socially marginal types who work for shares under an investor manager. The cooperatives in California and Victoria bear a canny resemblance to the famous Chinese Gongxi uh, of the gold mines in West Kalimantan or West Borneo in the 18th and early 19th century, egalitarian cooperatives that form on the basis of equal share provision. In 1904, across the Indian Ocean, Chinese miners began arriving in the Transvaal colony of South Africa, which had recently been annexed to the British Empire. This novel labor experiment was aimed at reviving the gold mines of the Witzwatersrand, then is now the largest gold producing region in the world, and addressing a shortage in native African labor in the wake of the South African War. Between 1904 and 1910, the Transvaal Chamber of Mines imported over 60,000 Chinese to work on the Rand. Unlike the independent Chinese miners in North America and Australia, Chinese late mine laborers went to the RAND under contracts. These contracts set their wages and hours, forbade them from working in any other occupation or industry and from owning or leasing property and required them to return to China at the conclusion of their contract. But if these Chinese mining laborers in South Africa were indentured, they were not docile. They rioted, went on strike, deserted their compounds, and passively resisted by simply refusing to drill more than the daily minimum number of inches required of them. Between 1904 and 1907, nearly 25,000 Chinese laborers, more than a third of the total working on the RAND, were convicted of various offenses, including refusing to work, rioting, staging work actions, desertion, as well as assault, manslaughter, and murder. Notably, kinship and fictive kin groups also existed on the RAND, and they were key to organizing resistance among the workers. The Cooley trope originated in California, where it drew from the proximate examples of indentured Asian labor in Caribbean plantation colonies, and especially African slavery in the American South. The association of Chinese labor with slavery was a kind of racial shorthand that cast Chinese as a racial danger to free white labor. It was first used in 1852 by California's first governor, John Bigler, who raised alarm over the quote, present wholesale importation to this country of immigrants from the Asiatic quarter of the globe, in particular that class of Asiatics known as coolies. Bigler called upon the legislature to impose heavy taxes on the Chinese and for a law barring Chinese contract labor from the mines. Now, what was Bigler's intent? The Chinese in California were not coolies or indentured workers, but Bigler was in a tight race for re-election and he used the coolie myth to agitate voters in the mining districts 
where independent prospectors were anxious over the declining surface mines and the entrance of deep capitalized mining on the scene. This was a classic strategy taken from the nativist playbook, appeal to a grievance, offer a theory of racial difference, and weaponize that theory for partisan politics. Within days of Bigler's address, Chinese community leaders responded. One of the most interesting is a letter written to Bigler by a man named uh, Yuan Sheng, who was head of the Yanghe Huiguan. He had been a merchant in South Carolina in the 1820s and was a naturalized US citizen. At some point he returned to China and then he came back to San Francisco in 1849. Yuan understood American racial politics. He wrote, quote, you have degraded the Negro because of your holding him in involuntary servitude and because for the sake of the union in some of your states, such is tolerated. Among this class, you would endeavor to place us and no doubt it would be pleasing to some would be freemen to mark the brand of servitude upon us. But we are not the degraded race you make us. We came amongst you as mechanics and traders and following every honorable business of life. Now, a resurgence of racism against the Chinese engulfed San Francisco in the 1870s, including mob violence, arson, discriminatory local laws. This hatred was different from that of the gold rush. It emerged after the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1869, which brought unforeseen consequences to the American West. California's new connection to the East Coast encouraged domestic migration and the importation of cheap manufactured goods, resulting in falling wages and unemployment. Integration into the national market brought the long tail of economic recession from the East. The Cooley trope was remarkably adaptive to these new conditions. The philosopher Henry George gave it theoretical heft using what was then referred to as the Chinese question to test his emerging views about labor and monopoly. He argued that unlike European immigrants whose wages eventually rose to the level of the native born workers, Chinese immigrants were a permanent source of cheap labor because they were unassimilable coolies. George imagined a class struggle between workers and capitalists with the Chinese in the camp of the capitalists. Anti-cooliism also targeted Chinese women. The Page Act of 1875, the first Chinese exclusion law in the United States barred so-called Mongolian prostitutes from entering the country. This law required all women to be interrogated upon entry to prove they were not a prostitute, and unsurprisingly, Chinese female immigration plummeted. That satisfied the real motive behind the Page Act, which is the prevention of Chinese population growth through natural reproduction. The leg legislation left a legacy of separated families and helped establish the enduring stereotype of the Oriental woman as both dangerous and desirable. The Page Act also barred foreign contract laborers, but it could not keep out Chinese men because they were not actually indentured. But eventually, anti cooliism triumphed in national politics, but only after revising the Burlingame Treaty with China of 1868, which provided for free immigration and overcoming the legacy of anti-slavery politics in the North. This cartoon by Thomas Nast is actually against exclusion, notwithstanding its racial caricatures of Chinese and Irish. The Chinese exclusion law passed Congress in 1882 with a political alliance between the West and the South, the two bastions of conservatism and white supremacy in the reconstruction era. The Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 barred all laborers, uh, all Chinese laborers from entering the, the country and all Chinese from naturalized citizenship. The exclusion laws codified the idea that Chinese were racially unassimilable. They could never be anything but a coolie race controlled by despotic masters without individual personality or will, without independence in thought or action. The United States Supreme Court layered another theory onto Cooleyism, that Chinese exclusion was necessary for national security. 
in its ruling Che Chan Ping v. U.S. in 1889, and you can read some of it here, it argued that even though there was no war with China, Chinese immigrants were potential, if not actual, foreign agents of an enemy nation, and therefore they should be excluded. Previously, federal regulation of immigration had been justified under the Commerce Clause of the Constitution. In upholding Chinese exclusion, the court invoked national security to justify a racist law. And it bears noting that this, this uh, jurisprudence that immigration is a matter of national security remains the foundation of American immigration policy. The Chinese exclusion laws uh, encourage racist attacks on Chinese in the West, which actually increased after the laws passed as the law gave license to riots and driving out campaigns. Exclusion was subsequently extended to, the pe to Chinese people from the Philippines uh, and to India and Japan. Indeed, an entire barred Asiatic zone was established in 1917, lumping different national origin groups into a single racial category called the Asiatic. Modern colonialism and global trade meant a greater integration of the global economy and with it mass migration sparking struggles of race and immigration policy throughout the Anglophone world. The Chinese merchants had pointed out in 1852 that trade begets migration and vice versa. Thus, American policymakers constructed an open door to China that would swing only one way, allowing American products, missionaries, and capital to enter China while keeping Chinese people out of the United States. For all its talk about the equality of nations and the open door, the American approach was typically colonial, treating China as an object of commercial and missionary desire, but Chinese people as degraded and backward, undesirable for immigrants. Now the coolie trope is so ubiquitous in the United States, I was surprised that it was not part of the anti-Chinese discourse on the Australian gold fields, but it would not have had the same purchase in Australia because the history of bound labor or unfreedom in Australia was not African slavery, but convict transportation of the English and Irish poor. Anti-Chinese racism was more inchoate on the Victoria gold fields. There was no theory of coolism like that had been developed in California. More relevant was Australians' insecurity at being a small population at the fringes of the British Empire in Asia only 400,000 people in 1850, who feared being overwhelmed by China's large population. One Melbourne newspaper wrote, geographically, we are nearer the pent up millions of China than any other large tract occupied by the white man. We are still but a handful of men and women and children. But the coolie trope did enter Australia politics. It was later in the 1870s in Queensland where whites felt threatened by Chinese and Pacific Islander workers in mining as well as agriculture. Australia posed an interesting case where plantations used cheap colored labor, uh, but they were not on separate island colonies like Jamaica or Mauritius, but in areas that were contiguous to settlements in the temperate zones, areas that white people had staked out for themselves. In, Boone, in both New South Wales, in Victoria, as well as in California. The coolie trope was adopted by white working men's movements in the cities, even though Chinese labor was not in any of these places a substantial threat to white employment. The urban labor movement in Sydney and Melbourne adopted coolie themes from California, which served to rally trade unions to the nationalist agenda unabashedly called White Australia. In South Africa, skilled white workers of the mines included many Australian immigrants, including leaders of the English speaking or the British trade unions. These men were direct carriers of anti coolism and the white Australia policy. Another source of anti Chinese racism was Afrikaner politics, which viewed Chinese labor as a threat to poor whites who suffered from high levels of unemployment and poverty after the South African War. Although Chinese indentured labor was strictly controlled, white South Africans feared they would make their way into semi-skilled and skilled jobs 
and paved the way for their even greater fear that native African workers would do the same. This was a time when the color line in South Africa had not yet hardened. The Chinese question was a problem that complicated the so-called native question and its resolution, that is exclusion, was necessary for that problem to be fully addressed. The question of Chinese labor in South Africa also shot into metropolitan British politics. It was a key campaign issue in the 1906 general elections in Great Britain. Charges that the Chinese on the Rand were kept in conditions akin to slavery helped bring the Liberal Party to power, overturning 20 years of nearly continuous conservative rule. It was especially powerful for the Liberals' labor allies, which echoed the abolitionist rhetoric, but which was, in my view, more moved practically by the question of working class emigration to the British settler colonies, which they viewed as their racial prerogative. The settler colonies of the British Empire followed the example of American legislation. Canada mimicked America's Chinese exclusion law. Australia adopted an unapologetic white Australia policy in 1901. South Africa took inspiration from Jim Crow in the US and from white Australia. In the early 20th century, American and British racists were publishing paranoid screeds such as Madison Grant's The Passing of the Great Race, Lawrence Neem's The Asiatic Danger in the Colonies, and Lothrop Starter's The Rising Tide of Color to promote the idea that the temperate zones of the world should be reserved for the white race. These were early iterations of what white supremacists today call replacement theory. So in these ways, the Chinese question and the Cooley trope circumnavigated the Anglophone world, starting in California and adapting as it moved across the Antipodes into South Africa and then to metropolitan Britain itself. Now, to the extent that the Chinese question criticized the so-called slavery of Chinese workers, none of these critics called for their freedom from slavery. None of them called for free immigration and none of them called for equal rights. They all called for their exclusion. Now also traversing the globe were protests and resistance by Chinese immigrants themselves, especially among merchant leaders and Christians who were educated and bilingual. They were joined by Qing diplomats and consular officials who were direct conduits between Chinese communities abroad and the central government. The Qing uh, consul in San Francisco in the 1880s, Feng Zhenxian, worked tirelessly on behalf of the immigrants and was instrumental in bringing lawsuits to protect, protect Chinese from discrimination. Like Tape v. Hurley, the school exclusion case, which I write about in my book, The Lucky Ones, and Yik Wo v. Hopkins, the Supreme Court decision that struck down San Francisco's discriminatory laundry ordinance and confirmed that the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment applied to all persons, not just citizens. So in the last section of the book, I consider the relationship of the exclusion policy from the West to China's position in the global economy and global politics. Uh, most directly, exclusion meant fewer outlets for Chinese merchants and investors in the West. Exclusion meant a shrinking population and a shrinking market, a shrinking ethnic market, and many of the biggest merchants in California and Australia returned to China or recloaded elsewhere, especially to Southeast Asia. The decline in silver prices relative to gold in the late 19th century had a direct impact on China, whose monetary system continued to be based on silver, when the gold standard came to dominate international trade in the late 19th century. The declining price, I'm sorry, the declining gold price of silver meant that China's imports were costlier. It also increased the cost of the war indemnities after the first Sino-Japanese War and the Boxer Protocols, which for the first time were made payable in gold. Two American economists writing about China's foreign trade in the early 20th century made special note of the role that overseas Chinese remittances played in China's balance of trade accounts. Remittances range from an estimated $50 million a year between 1902 and 1913, and double that amount by the late 1920s. 
counted as assets, remittances enabled China to carry a modest net surplus in its balance of trade. So even as exclusion policies shut Chinese out of the social and economic mainstream in the West, the immigrants carried gold dust home in the linings of their jackets and sent foreign exchange through their jinxian or their silver letters. The fluctuating rates of exchange between gold and silver were not just matters for accountants and financiers. Chinese immigrants also followed them as well. They knew how their remittances sent in foreign exchange would translate to local currency. One of the ironies of the Chinese question is that overseas Chinese in the United States, Australia, and Southeast Asia held on to their savings and remitted large amounts to China when the price of silver dropped. Finally, it must be said that the circumnavigation of the Chinese question was not only the foundation for Chinese exclusion policies, the Chinese question was also a catalyst for Chinese nationalism in China, which developed in connection with politics in its diasporic communities. As is well known, Kang Youwei and Sun Yat-sen actively organized among Chinese overseas. After the overthrow of the Qing, Oh, wait, I want to show you this. This is um, Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, translated as a slave's cry to heaven, um, which was uh, the first American novel translate, published in translation in Chinese. After the overthrow of the Qing, the Republic of China was unable to convince the United States and the British dominions to repeal their exclusion laws. The United States did not do so until 1943 as a wartime measure, but it kept quotas on Chinese and other Asian immigration very low. It was only after 1965 and in the 1970s elsewhere that restrictions on Asian immigration eased. In the last 50 years, the Chinese population in the United States and Australia grew tremendously with new immigrations that built or rebuilt robust communities. Still, I argue the Chinese question never completely went away. It was always just beneath the surface. In our own time, the Chinese question is tied to anxieties about China's rise as a world economic power. In the United States, Asian Americans make up less than 6% of the total population, less than 6%. And yet many white Americans believe there are too many Asians, that they are a threat and that we are blamed for the coronavirus and myriad social ills. Today, we see the coolie trope repurposed, now embodied in the figure of the factory workers in the special economic zones in China and in the Chinese international students and Chinese American students in American universities. Both the factory worker and the student are imagined as robotic, who study or work insanely long hours without complaint under the rule of despotic masters, whether it's the Communist Party or Tiger Mothers. They are considered unfair competition to whites because they are not, quote, normal, unquote. Now, as a historian, I do not believe that history simply repeats itself. Racism is produced and reproduced in specific historical and political circumstances. This helps us understand that racism is not an innate product of the human condition and that indeed, if it is a political project, it can also be opposed and undone. We have choices. The great African-American leader, Frederick Douglass, spoke out against Chinese exclusion in 1869. He recognized it as a backward move that threatened the freedom of the former slaves and indeed of all Americans. In his famous speech called Our Composite Nation, Douglas recognized that immigration was a human right. I think that's amazing that in 1869, he spoke in the language of human rights. He said, we should welcome the Chinese. And he was unbothered by the prospect that the Chinese might come in large numbers. Let them come, he said, and will let us welcome them for they will become a part of the nation. Douglas also made a prescient connection between domestic immigration policy and imperialistic foreign policy. He said, if the white race may exclude all other races from this continent, it might 
rightfully do the same in respect to all other lands, islands, capes, and continents, and thus have all the world to itself. Thus what would seem to belong to the whole would become the property only of a part. Frederick Douglass offered Americans a choice, a choice between a society based on democracy and inclusion, or one based on white supremacy, inequality, and exclusion. Sadly, the latter path was taken and no smart and no small part owing to the political alliance between the South and the West. Today in the United States, politics are extremely polarized and threaten our democracy. But we still have a choice. Should we choose a path towards a more inclusive future? Should we, should we decide to stand in solidarity against all racisms? Addressing anti-Chinese and anti-Asian racism today is part of the larger struggle in the United States that is unfolding between equality and inequality, between democracy and authoritarianism. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Nai, for a very inspiring and a sobering lecture. Uh, we're now in the Q&A, so please type your questions in the Q&A box on the bottom of the screen. Um, I'll start. So it's very sobering, and we say that studying history will teach us about the present. So it's... Uh, what do you think, any difference between the white supremacy in the late 90s and uh, what we're experiencing now? And uh, what do you think we should do? <laughs> it's a big question. <laughs> it's a big question. And uh, I can't really tell people what to do. But um, I think, uh, you know, since the 1960s, since the period after World War II, and the end of the 20th century, we had a uh, an era of uh, more liberal inclusion. It was far from perfect, but there were civil rights laws that were passed. There was uh, um, steps made uh, combating discrimination in employment, college admissions, um, uh, real estate, you know, home ownership, et cetera. Um, so there were uh, a broader array of democratic rights uh, led by the African-American community, which also redounded to other people of color. And in the last 15 to 20 years, we've seen uh, some would call a backlash politics, um, a resurgence of white supremacy and opposition to civil rights. Um, these are grievances that are often expressed as um, the uh, anxieties of white working class people, especially white men who fear that immigration has uh, threatened their livelihood. Now, in fact, the immigrants don't take the jobs of the white people. You don't see the auto factories laying off white men and hiring immigrants. You don't see uh, employment in uh, basic industries uh, taken over by immigrants. The unemployment in those areas is caused by two things. It's caused by uh, global outsourcing of manufacturing and by um, uh, artificial intelligence, by uh, robotics. But the politicians have convinced these workers that their troubles are caused by immigrants. And a lot of, I think, the racism held by uh, people, uh, by whites, uh, which has now, uh, now you have a political climate where it's okay to say all these things out loud. You know, they might have uh, been more quiet, you know, 25 years ago, but now they have no qualms about uh, speaking in, in racist uh, language. And of course we had a president, uh, the, not the present one, but the one before, who openly traded in this kind of racial discourse. So uh, that phenomenon itself is not new. You know, blaming immigrants or blaming Chinese for unemployment when unemployment is actually caused by a more structural change in the economy, much bigger, uh, what they call um, uh, 
uh, well, well, structural changes. But I think we have a very dangerous situation now because we have one party that is no longer interested in democracy. In fact, their agenda is to restrict democracy, to restrict people from voting, to prevent people from voting, to say that elections are stolen when in fact they were not stolen, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we live in a very dangerous time right now. And um, uh, racism is a big uh, motivator uh, driving right-wing politics. Uh, it's not the only thing though. I think there's a lot of other uh, vectors that are at play. So what should we do? Those of us who are citizens and can vote, we have to vote, we have to protect the vote. Um, and uh, voting isn't everything, but if you don't have the vote, you're really in a bad place. So I think uh, if I should say anything about what we should do, we should make sure we vote and vote for democracy. Don't vote for fascism. Absolutely. Uh, the reason I asked the why, what we should do is it seems like uh, for the old, you know, to break the uh, anti-Asian uh, law uh, was by white people who are not Asian to advocate for the Asian people. Um, part of it because at that time there were very few uh, immigrants right, allowed in this land. So now only, even if we own there are only 6%, but still significantly more. So do you think in order to change the situation, do we rely on ourselves or we need, again, need non-Asian people, white people or black people and Hispanic people to unite with us to advocate for democracy? Yeah, I'm looking at the Q&A box and we have uh, a comment or question from Professor Gayatri Spivak. Um, can, she, can she ask the question or do we have to read it? I'll read it okay. uh, from Professor Spivak. Uh, I want to ask a question about general solidarity outside of ethnically inspired activist circles. So I think that's so a that's similar question. question that you were raising. Thank mm -hmm. you, uh, Gayatri, for being here and for uh, raising that question. Thank you very much. I think solidarity has to start with ourselves. If we don't, if we don't defend ourselves, nobody will defend us. So we have to start with ourselves, but we have to reach out beyond ourselves. And I think this is something that takes a lot of work. And um, oh, you said ethically ethically inspired activist circles. So how do we win over people who are not ethically inclined to support us? Is that what you're asking? How do we win pe those people over? Let's see, not ethically, uh, uh, not ethnically, I said ethically. So are you asking, Gayatri, are you asking how do we win people over who don't agree with us, who have a different moral standard? Is that what you're asking? Okay, while well, we wait for that. Well, we actually... I think I think it's, I would say the same thing, which is that we, you know, if you have a, a group who is oppressed, you know, the, the oppressed have to speak up for themselves. And then you uh, hope to get support from others I personally do not think it's worth our time to try to uh, win over the racists. I don't, I, that's not where I would want to put my energy. I think our energy is to educate people who are open to being educated. And some people just do not want to be educated and uh, we don't, there aren't enough hours in the day. So we also have a question from WeChat. By the way, we had over a hundred people uh, online at WeChat and the 30 people here at the webinar. So it's a very well attended uh, webinar. Thank you, Professor Nye. So question from WeChat. History doesn't repeat itself, but do you think that there's a still a high degree of similarity in its cyclical trends given the current state? 
it seems that despite different levels of development in each era, the competition for resources hasn't improved much and the underlying logic of the ways we compete hasn't become more civilized. So do you think there's a still a high degree of a similarity in its cyclical trend? So does the history repeat I, I think No, I, I don't think history repeats itself in general, but I think that there are some things that have uh, long reaches over time um, that can be uh, repurposed or, or, or revitalized for present interests. Um, I think that there is a difference today because of climate change and because um, of uh, diminishing resources in the world. In a way, uh, the threat of authoritarianism, uh, not only in the United States, but in other countries, uh, a lot of that is about hoarding. It's about elites hoarding resources in the face of what they believe is a, a world of scarce resources. Uh, and I think understood that way, um, you know, it, it puts a diff slightly different uh, light on on the question of uh, democracy versus authoritarianism. Um, Professor Spivak has clarified. She says, uh, "How to uh, democracy is not voting blocks; it's how to get into the generally oppressed." You know, I uh, people people have identified themselves in different ways and. Uh, there's a whole industry that tries to identify voters by interests and it's driven by algorithm and demographics. And, you know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, possibly some of it makes sense, but people cannot be reduced to algorithm or, or simply dem demographics. Um, I just hope people will understand that the future looks one way uh, under democracy it might look very messy, it might look very complicated, it might look uncomfortable, but the way it looks the other way in terms of authoritarianism or fascism is, is deeply troubling. And I think the problem is a lot of people don't like to look that far down the road. And American voters have are notoriously uh, amnesiac. Uh, they don't pay attention and they don't remember. So it's very hard to get voters' attention. But I do think that um, notwithstanding the problem of so-called voting blocks, I think certain things have um, uh, sparked interest in the election. Uh, one, of, one of them, of course, is immigration and race, and that's on both sides. But also women, including white middle-class women uh, who are uh, not necessarily that political, are very worried about their reproductive rights. And we've already seen uh, since the Dobbs ruling in many states, measures protecting uh, state measures, whether it's laws or state constitution, uh, constitutional measures that protect reproductive rights. Those have been astounding in their success, including in red states. So I, I think there are, um, people are very concerned about gun violence right across the country. So I, I don't know if you call these voting blocks, but there are myriad uh, problems in our society that I think are waking up people in uh, who are not necessarily identified as a block. Here's another question. Um, as Asian parents, what we should tell our children, emphasis difference or highlight common interests? It's a good question. Well, I think we have to do both. <laughs> Maybe that's that's not a that's not a good answer for you, but I think we have to do both. But what I mean is that um, you cannot highlight common interests to the point where children uh, don't understand who they are, what their family history is, their cultural heritage. Uh, that's part of who they are, and so. Uh, Many Asian Americans in my generation, uh, their parent whose parents were immigrants, they they wanted us to become Americans, 
So they didn't, you know, they didn't pay that much attention. They didn't think it was that important or they actually thought it was a negative thing if they if they uh, practice all the Chinese cultural customs. And then you grow up and you say, well, but who am I, right? So I think you have to do both. I think you have to teach them that they can be proud of their family's background and their cultural background, but they also are have common interests with other people and they should never hold their ethnicity above others. Um, any more questions from WeChat or from the webinar? If no more questions, thank you very much, Professor Nai, for a very enlightening and very sobering. And I think study history will teach us about the present, even if history doesn't repeat itself. So thank you very much for this outstanding award lecture. Uh, this is also, it's the book series of the uh, Global Center Beijing. So it serves both purposes. Thank you, Professor Nye, and thanks everyone for attending uh, online and on, on WeChat. And the program, this lecture is also going to be streamed on YouTube. So you can watch it again. <laughs> so, thank, thank you, you very much. Good thank night. You. Good thank day. Thank you for inviting me and thank you all for attending. Good night. Thank you. Good, Good night. Morning.